the perfect neighbor, the pillar of the community. Some of history's most lethal killers have led a double life. One part, Mr. Nice. He was there smiling on the cover. He was the poster boy. The other, homicidal maniac. I got a killer, I got a killer, I got a killer. Forensic psychologist Lou Schlesinger has spent decades delving into the minds of murderers. The notion of a serial sexual murderer lives in his mother's basement and, you know, kills cats is just incorrect. Serving detective Jackie Sabir is an expert in the mechanics of crime. The killer has a good working knowledge of this building. Between them, they're dissecting a case that struck fear through a community. That specter, that ghost, that man without a face, it was all back. The anger in his eyes, that was the one thing that stuck with me for years and years. And investigating if its perpetrator was born to join this most elusive breed of killer. I just knew in that moment I was going to die. With over 20 years' experience in homicide, Detective Jackie Sabir has headed up some of Britain's most high-profile murder cases. She's in the suburbs of Buffalo, the unlikely site of a crime that sent shockwaves through western New York. One of the really special and exceptional things about Buffalo is actually the stability of the community here. People feel safe and people that grow up here often come back here to raise their children. There's a good standard of living, there's stable employment, even through some very difficult economic times. And nowhere is this sense of tranquility more apparent than in the idyllic neighborhood of Amherst. Amherst has been voted one of the safest communities in America. It's a picturesque community, a, a community of affluence. It's uh, where most families aspire to move or live in. Just a, a very nice place to live and to raise kids. Each year, the beautiful setting also attracts over 30,000 students. It's home to one of the largest universities in New York State, University of Buffalo. As most campuses do, it has an, a, a jogging or biking trail fixed to it. It runs along Elka Creek, and it's a beautiful paved trail that you can run, bike, rollerblade. During the fall of 1990, second-year communication student Linda Yalem had been making the most of the green open space. Lindy Allen originally came from California. She was a marathon runner. She was training for the New York City Marathon. She's near the end of her training. She's only five weeks away. On the 29th of September, the 22-year-old stuck to her fitness regime. Lindy Allen left her dorm room that morning about 9.30 or so. It was a nice sunny day. She had a Walkman. She popped in a cassette, and she went out to do what she did all the time, run. Her roommates were expecting her back in, you know, a fair amount of time. And uh, she just never came back. An extensive search was launched along the bike path where Linda was known to have been running. Major Steve Negrelli recalls the moment the hunt for the student came to an end. They stretched this whole five-mile path, searching the path, the woods, and where we're standing now, Linda's body was recovered. She was shrouded with her sweatshirt covering her torso. Underneath the sweatshirt, her brassiere and T-shirt was lifted up, exposing her breast. Her pants were pulled down off of her one leg. Was there any signs of defensive injuries? She had numerous uh, injuries upon her face, 
in, um, in her body, abrasions and bruises that indicated that she did try to fight her assailant. Despite her efforts, Linda's assailant cruelly controlled her. The assailant put duct tape over both her nose and her mouth. She was unable to gasp any air. In fact, she was sucking so hard that the duct tape was actually indented into her mouth. As the perpetrator raped his victim, he inflicted further torment through the use of a handled garrote. Why would someone use a garrote in that sort of case? What do you think he was doing with Linda? The garrote, by its very nature, where you can render someone unconscious just with a couple of twists, is a control mechanism. And what he did is he did a double loop. So if I could demonstrate, yep. he just went over yep. and back. And just by one hand, because now he had both broomsticks in his hand, he's able to tighten the garrote and bring his victims in and out of consciousness. They left signature garrote marks, uh, ligature marks across her neck. You're very close to your victim. You're going to be looking in their eyes, aren't you? You're going to be able to see what you're, you're doing to them, aren't you? That's correct. Forensic psychologist Lou Schlesinger has analyzed the minds of some of history's most twisted serial killers. For him, the torturous technique carried out on Linda Yalem raises huge concerns. When you use a ligature or manual strangulation to kill someone, that tells me it's personal because it's an inefficient way to kill somebody. It takes a long time. They could fight their way out of it. So when you kill with strangulation, that is almost always a sexual element involved because you're seeing the victim suffer. And strangulation has been the sordid choice for a class of killer who only get their kicks out of this sadistic MO. During the 1980s, Virginia's Southside Strangler, Timothy Spencer, created tourniquets from belongings found in his victims' homes. He had two socks wrapped around her neck and a 16 inch vacuum cleaner extension twisted in the ligature. Tampa Bay murderer Bobby Joe Long would bring his own ligature to the scene of the crime. He just left the ligature right on the victim. Why did he do it? Because for some reason that was arousing to him to see the victim lying there with the ligature just hanging off her. And right in here's where I killed her. This class of killer is perhaps topped by America's most prolific serial murderer. Thank you, put like uh, five, five. Of, five of them in there. Gary Ridgway was the archetypal guy next door, but in his hidden life, he strangled dozens of prostitutes. When I got through having a, a climax with her, I jumped on her. How much are you pulling on her neck? I'm pulling really hard on her neck. How? Just like this. What are you saying to her? Don't fight, don't fight, and don't, and I'll let you go. No, Ridgway was never going to let him go. He got him in the strangulation hold, and he basically said to them, if you relax and just let me go through my little sexual thing, I'm going to let you go. And when she relaxed, he then strangled her and killed her. I'm feeling, I got to kill her, I got to kill her, I got to kill her. They want to get close and touch the person as she's dying. This is what's stimulating for all of these individuals, like Gary Ridgway and Long, and, and, and so many of them who kill with that method. In 1990, in Amherst, Buffalo, the community had been shattered by the strangulation of student Linda Yalem. She was jogging in the middle of the day. She was attacked. No one saw her coming or going. No one saw the attacker coming or going. How does that happen? Detective Jackie Sabir is on the scene with Major Stephen Negrelli as he recalls the moment detectives received a break in the case. A woman called and said she saw a man behind a woman pulling her from behind, pulling across this exact bridge. The sighting suggested that the killer was acting with unabated confidence. 
this is a Saturday in the month of September. This path is teeming with people. He was brazen enough during daylight hours to grab a victim, drag her over the bridge, and rape her and leave her right here. But as the investigation gathered momentum, it became clear that the assailant's actions were far from random. So the detectives had witnesses that suggested that he'd been staking out the place days before. That's correct. And one such witness was a local factory worker who had spotted a work colleague in the vicinity just days before Linda's death. And this co-worker saw his fellow co-worker walking on that path. Thought it was unusual, went to talk to him, and his co-worker pretended like he didn't see him. Acted bizarre. Although the factory worker was brought in for questioning, no one suspected the murderer could be this pillar of the community. Altimio Sanchez. He coached the boys' baseball team. He played on, you know, community baseball teams uh, through his church. All of his neighbors said he's, he's the greatest guy. He, he'll mow your lawn for you. He has the nicest looking lawn in the neighborhood. He invites him over to barbecues and things like that. Despite the model neighbor bearing a marked similarity to the perpetrator, close colleagues on his shift at the factory didn't take it too seriously. There was a father and son who worked at the plant as well. And when the composite sketch was out there, they used to joke with him and say, hey, Al, this looks just like you. And he'd kind of chuckle. The residents of Buffalo couldn't imagine that the perfect husband and all-round good guy was concealing a double life. Forensic psychologist Lou Schlesinger and serving detective Jackie Sabir are unraveling a case that rocked a suburb of Buffalo, New York. In 1990, Amherst student Linda Yalem was sadistically raped and strangled on a local bike path. For Jackie Sabir, the killer's movements reveal a meticulous operator. This is an incredibly open public space. So for him to have the confidence to have staked out this location, knowing that he wouldn't be disturbed, starts really raising the levels of anxiety of the detectives. This wasn't a spontaneous assault. This was premeditated. And it appeared the calculated killer may have struck before. His technique resembled an MO displayed in a series of sex attacks perpetrated by a character dubbed the Bike Path Rapist. The Bike Path Rapist first became known to me when I was a teenager. A girl from my high school had gotten raped. He would prey in areas where there were either high schools or um, recreational areas that would, you know, um, younger women would typically utilize. He was using a knife, he was using a gun, and then he started using the double ligature garret. The period of attacks was so prolonged, Lisa Redmond's childhood memories would be brought sharply into focus as she pursued the rapist as an investigator. Did he cause any other injuries to the victims? Was there any other violence other than the actual sexual offense? One of the rape victims managed to get her fingers underneath the garret and he was choking her so hard, it actually bent her fingers. And years and years later, she showed me her fingers were still bent. The sex attacker cast his net wide over Buffalo's green open spaces. So we've got rapes down in this location in the south. We've got rapes here. We've got the University of Buffalo where Linda was killed. Yes. So we've got a homicide up here. We've got clusters of locations where offences happen. These you would not know unless you had knowledge of that area 
he's tailoring his crime and his location to his victims. In 1986, 17 year old Hamburg schoolgirl Susie Coggins would experience the terrible wrath of the rapist firsthand. I was walking to a nine o'clock class. That day I was running late, so I had to cut through all the bike paths to get to school so I wouldn't be late. I heard someone running through the woods. I turned over my shoulder to look and I saw this guy. I saw the rope in his hand and I thought, he must be running his dog or something. But the perpetrator wrapped the rope round Susie's neck, lifting her off the ground. When I went up in the air, I couldn't breathe. Everything stopped in that time and that moment. And then he started dragging me back into the woods. And the anger in his eyes, I just, I'll never, that was the one thing that stuck with me for years and years, those eyes, the way he looked. Once in a secluded spot, the rapist broke his silence. He just asked me how old I was and, um, and if I had ever had sex before. <laughs> I just kept thinking about my family. I'm sorry, you know, like, I just kept thinking, I'm, I'll never see my family again, I'll never see my friends again. I just knew in that moment I was gonna die. Susie was then subjected to a prolonged rape. When he was finished, and I'm like, well, what happens next? And he says, nothing. I felt like there was some guilt in his voice. And yeah, his energy changed completely from the beginning of it till the end of it. As police desperately pursued the rapist, charismatic factory worker Altimio Sanchez was as popular as ever. He was a jock. So people at work loved having him on their softball team, running with him, golfing him. He was an outstanding golfer. He was a guy that guys wanted to hang out with. Despite his jovial demeanor, Altimio Sanchez's start to life had been far from happy. As a child, he struggled academically, but Sanchez would insist his biggest challenge was out of school, living with his alcoholic mother. She would frequently remind Al, you know, you weren't, you weren't wanted. She openly told him during his life, you know, when she was pregnant with him, that she actually bought a kind of a concoction of drugs that would induce an abortion and, and use those, those drugs uh, during her pregnancy. The unwanted child had been born into a turbulent home in 1958 in Puerto Rico. He was one of four children. There was family tension between mom and dad, and um, I believe dad left when he was very young. I think he was two years old when dad left. His mother uh, discovered very early on that his, that his father was having an affair and moved the family to New York City. However, life in the big city didn't offer a fresh start for the Sanchez family. He had spent a lot of time uh, with his mother living with different men. He one time lived in the back of a car. She allowed various men into her life. He alleges that those men abused him physically and emotionally during that time period. Sanchez stated he also repeatedly saw his alcoholic mother being abused by her violent partner. For forensic psychologist Lou Schlesinger, a child witnessing aggressive behavior against his maternal figure can have devastating consequences in later life. The main effect that that has is it desensitizes the child to violence. He sees an aggressive boyfriend, an aggressive father figure who treats women like this, and he identifies with the aggressive person rather than identifying with the victim. 
Many of history's most despicable killers have developed a dysfunctional view of their mothers in their formative years. As a child, the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, regularly saw his father humiliating his mother, Kathleen. One time, John Sutcliffe spotted Kathleen talking to two men in a pub. That's all talking. And he slapped her straight across the face. So here we have his father saying, you know, this is what you do to be a, a man. And, you know, um, Peter is very much saw women as either Madonnas or whores. You're basically using your parents as a role model. And if that's what your role model is doing, it stands to reason you're going to do very similar sorts of things. But this crucial mother-son relationship can be affected in other ways. Serial murderer Gary Ridgway's maladjusted view was at the other end of the spectrum. He talked about having some sexual feelings towards her. He described in some detail uh, watching her when she was in a bathing suit and, and looking at her and thinking that she dressed pretty provocatively. During one bath, um, her uh, robe fell open and she was naked underneath and he felt aroused. Gary Ridgway is an individual whose mother was very sexually provocative in an overt sense. There's nothing more devastating psychologically for a boy to see that type of behavior in his mother. It usually doesn't end well at all. In 1990, in Buffalo, New York, police had connected the murder of student Linda Yalem to a string of brazen rapes committed along the area's bike paths and trails. What made this so bizarre is these are broad daylight attacks. But then, for the next two years, the brutal crimes ceased. Poof. He vanishes off the radar. Just a short drive away from the tranquil bike paths, Exchange Street in downtown Buffalo seemed a million miles away. The red light district was worked by a prostitute, Majane Mazer. Majane Mazer was turning tricks. Sometimes she would stand on corners. A lot of times she would give her number to people and they would call her. But on an October night, the vulnerable 32-year-old was picked up by the wrong man. A John called her. She went out to the curb, got in his car, took off. She was never seen again. OK, so this is the actual building. Right up to the fence line yeah. is where Majane Mazur's body was found. Bless her. Detective Jackie Sabir is joining Lisa Redmond as she revisits an industrial wasteland that in 1992 was the site of a horrific murder. A man actually picking wildflowers found her in the brush. It was not clear like it is now. It was overgrown and her body, not only was it camouflaged by the foliage, he actually put a piece of corrugated plastic over the top of her. When her body was discovered, what condition was her body in? She was lying prone. There was a plastic bag right around her head at the neck and then another garbage bag pulled over the top. On closer examination, Majane's cause of death was undeniable. There was evidence of ligature strangulation on Majane. She had the double ligature marks on her neck, but due to the circumstances that she was a prostitute, that she was covered the way she was, the investigators at the time did not put two and two together that she was a victim of the bike path rapist. Did the detectives form an impression of, of who could have done this, though? What type of person would have done this? 
they thought that it would be someone that she knew or was familiar with because of the way the person had painstakingly taken the time to try to hide the body. As police chased up leads, they were unaware that one of Jane Mazer's regular clients was a local family man leading a double life, Altimio Sanchez. In 1996, in the green suburbs of Buffalo, New York, six years had passed since the murder of Linda Yalem. In the wake of her tragic death, the local community was determined the young student would never be forgotten. Because Linda was a runner, there was something created called the Linda Yalem Memorial Run. It's an annual event, and it's to raise awareness about women's safety issues. Before the race would start, there would be a moment of silence, and then a bagpipe would lead the runners down to the starting line. Amongst those taking part in September 96 was competitor 635, local man Altimio Sanchez. It turned out that Altimio Sanchez uh, was a bit of a runner. He belonged to the running club at American Brass. It was seemingly a typical act for one of the community's all-round good guys. Detective Jackie Sabir has come to Chictawaga, the neighborhood in which Altimio Sanchez set up home with his college sweetheart 10 years previously. Chictawaga is a, an incredibly safe, quiet suburb, low crime, and it's great schools. And that's why Sanchez and his wife picked this location to raise their family. He had two sons. He was very involved in his community. Nothing remarkable about him. He just seemed like a neighbor. He was the guy that, uh, you know, when snowfall came, he'd be out there with his snowplow plowing out your driveway. He was um, a member of his local church community where he was coaching the softball league. His family were well known. He was here for a long time, so he'd established ties. In his working life at a nearby brass factory, Sanchez was also well liked. Fellow worker Ken Chakai would regularly chat with the forklift driver as his night shifts drew to a close. And your first impressions of him? He was just a no normal guy. Normal guy. Very nice guy, soft-spoken. Uh, I can't say anything bad about him. Was Sanchez ever in trouble at work, or were there no. any issues? He was a good worker. Yeah. Was there any gossip about him or no. rumors? He was going to church. The community, his family belonged to the church. He was a great guy. Nobody in Buffalo believed that Altimio Sanchez had anything to do with the murder of Linda Yalem. Having worked extensively with the FBI, Professor Lou Schlesinger is fully aware that for many, a serial killer is hard to spot. The notion of every serial sexual murderer being weird and a loner, uh, lives in his mother's basement and you know kills cats, is just incorrect. To further understand those capable of concealing a heinous double life, the psychologist is meeting an offender who ruthlessly targeted women. How did you feel when you were raping someone? Oh, I felt powerful. This inmate is a serial rapist who remained undetected within his community for over a year and a half. Someone who knows very little about this topic what could you say to help them understand the mind of a, of a serial rapist? For me, I hated myself. I felt that I, I uh, was inadequate. The sex offense is not about sex. It's, it's, about, it's about the power and control issues. It's about the self-esteem issues. It's about a person who is desperate to be accepted and, and validated as a person. While you were raping women, you were in a relationship with women. Well, I was, I, in this case, I was married. You were married. 
Did you feel you led a double life in a sense that nobody even knew you were capable of something like this? Oh, absolutely. Tell I mean, us about it. The, I mean, I, I, was, I had regular work. I worked hard. Uh, I was responsible. I enjoyed activities with other people. When different people that knew you from the community and whatnot realized what had happened, were they pretty shocked? Oh, yeah. Yes. No, didn't have a clue that you were capable right. of this. In fact, the, uh, I remember the prosecutor uh, dur at, during the case made a statement in court that, you know, in all other aspects of my life, this is the guy you would want your daughter to bring home because I was a steady nice person. I, right. Talk and, well, right. smart. Right. Mm -hmm. But I had this dark side that I was going out and raping. In his work as a profiler, Professor Lou Schlesinger has also experienced this chameleon-like ability in a class of killer that remained invisible to all around them. There's a large group of serial sexual murderers who have families and are married and work and have friends and acquaintances. She got sick, got her a glass of water, comforted her a little bit, and then went ahead and tied her up and then the bag over head and strangled her. Over a 30 year period in Kansas, Dennis Rader murdered 10 people. All the while, the respected scout camp leader hid an assortment of sordid behavior, frequently tying himself up within the local woods. He was very big into auto erotica. What he did was to leave the campsite where the Boy Scouts were and then he attached a camera to on a cord and would take photographs of his, his accomplishments. Most people believe they can detect deviancy and particularly danger in others when they really can't in some cases. In Riverside County during the 1990s, model citizen Bill Suff's murderous identity was even more impenetrable. He was supplying equipment to the police department, the same police department that was investigating him. A homicide victim was found one morning when uh, two of the investigators were with Bill and their pager went off and Bill made the comment to them, oh, did you find another body? If a person interacts with you and makes jokes and seems like a normal guy, why would you possibly suspect that he's capable of such extreme deviancy. In 2006, in Buffalo, New York, over a decade had passed since the bike path rapist had last struck. As time went on and there were no more attacks, I, I really believe that the community became less guarded. They believed that maybe he left the area, was in prison, or possibly dead. Collectively, the community still had it in the back of our minds. That's where we pushed it, because everyone wanted to believe deep down that we were safe. On the 16th anniversary of Linda Yalem's murder, respected neighbor and loving husband, Altimio Sanchez, had been out with his wife at an office reunion. He was photographed at a downtown bar at a party with a drink in his hand uh, with his wife, you know, with his arm around his wife. But amidst the celebrations, no one could have guessed how Altimio Sanchez had spent the day. A few hours earlier, in nearby Clarence, it had been a typical Friday morning for mother Joan Diver and her young family. They sat at the kitchen table and they had breakfast together. They talked about, maybe we go to a movie tonight because it's Friday night. She had dropped her five-year-old off at daycare and decided on a beautiful September day to go for a jog in Clarence. Joan parked her car in her usual spot before heading out along the bike path. But as the morning drew to a close, the 45-year-old didn't reappear from her run. At the normal time of pickup for daycare, mom didn't show. 
Her son kind of stood at the window and looked out the window like, where's mom? With no sign of Joan, an extensive search was mounted. Detective Jackie Sabir is joining Steve Negrelli as he retraces its final steps. A couple of Boy Scouts mm -hmm. and a scout leader, they just want to help the diver family, so yeah. they're out here volunteering, mm -hmm. searching. One of them kind of bent down, peered in, and he could see underneath the shrubbery in overgrowth, he could see what appeared to be a human hand. It was, in fact, Joan Diver. What did she actually look like when she was here? When she was laying on her back, her pants were down, her shirt had been lifted up, exposing her breast. You could see that she had been in a struggle. You could see that uh, there were some marks on her body. Although not witnessed for over a decade, the method of murder had a chilling familiarity. Those distinctive double ligature marks on her neck. So even after the 12 years had passed, it's almost like a, a textbook copy of what happened before. All the MO was lining up the time of day, a secluded bike path, a white female jogger, the ligature. Everything's going down that path. It's the bike path, it's bike path, it's bike path. As detectives discovered the victim's car had been moved, lab tests cast out any doubt that the perpetrator had returned. What came back was one droplet of sweat on the steering column uh, where you put the key in. They were able to obtain DNA sample from that exact key tumbler. That DNA that was discovered was in fact the DNA of the bike path rapist. That specter, that ghost, that man without a face, it was all back. But as his reign of terror entered a third decade, the identity of Buffalo's elusive serial killer was about to be unveiled. In September 2006, in Buffalo, the murder of jogger Joan Diver had marked the return of the bike path rapist after more than a decade's absence. As a serving detective, Jackie Sabir is in no doubt as to the impact of this tragic development. To come back after a 12-year break would have been an enormous shock to the team of investigators because you have to relive and pull all of those files again and start practically from the beginning. With the DNA sample indicating an Hispanic male, the list of suspects shrank down until an historic case left just one name. There had been a rape and the woman had seen the rapist a few days later at the mall followed him out and got his license plate. As the owner of the vehicle had a cast iron alibi, the lead had drawn a blank. But years later, as police recontacted him, the owner admitted a relation had borrowed the vehicle. We said, who was driving your car that night? And that's when he, the first time we heard this name, and he said, it was my nephew. His nephew's name has popped up a couple times previous in this investigation. He said it was Altimio Sanchez. It was like getting hit in the face with a baseball bat because after all these years, we finally had a name to this faceless monster that had been terrorizing the women of this community. With a direct DNA match, the church-going softball coach was questioned by Detective Lisa Redmond. At first, he didn't believe I was a police detective. It made me show him my badge. His attacks were about controlling women. 
He couldn't control her. She was in charge. It unnerved him. At one point, he said, I think you're something else. And I noted that he said something, not someone. You referred to me as something. As news of the arrest spread, local residents struggled to comprehend the identity of the unmasked killer. Neighbors going on TV saying that we had the wrong guy, that we were wrong. Altimo Sanchez's wife, I really don't think that she had any idea what was going on. In the morning, he commits a murder. At night, he's with a work party with her. And while she's pregnant with one of their children, he's out raping or he's patronizing prostitutes. I don't think she saw any of this madness, that, that dark side of him at all. The factory night shift workers' colleagues were left equally mystified. When the news came that the bike path rapist was arrested, the one gentleman I interviewed said, that's great, he's, he's, he's off the streets, finally. And then they said, you know, it's, it's Al Sanchez. And he, he swore and said, why are you picking on Al? It couldn't be Al. But those who had experienced the dark side of Altimio Sanchez were in no doubt that police had got the right man. I remember running as fast as I could to the TV, and I'm like, oh my god, that's him. I saw those eyes, and I just remember falling to my knees. I just started crying. It was just, it was finally over. It was finally over. Basically, what we had was a monster living amongst us that we never realized was there. In court, Altimio Sanchez would be sentenced for the murders of Linda Yalem, Majane Mazer, and Joan Diver. He's looking like he's a broken man. You know, his head's bowed, you know, his hands are clasped in front of him. Such a slap in the face to see him play that role because he absolutely was not sorry for any of his victims. He was sorry he was caught. Whilst Altimio Sanchez presented himself as remorseful, other killers who deceived all around them have played out their final acts of freedom in different ways. Gary Ridgway quietly faced his victims. How do you plead to the charge of aggravated murder in the first degree as charged in count five? Guilty. Dennis Rader reveled in detailing his heinous crimes. I got on top of her and then strangled her with a belt at that time. But to fully appreciate these cold-blooded killers, Professor Lou Schlesinger believes you have to look to the past. If you want to understand an offender, don't go by how he appears in court. Take a look at what he did. What he did tells you what the offender is really like. And Altimio Sanchez's brutal history undoubtedly bears the hallmarks of this most dangerous class of killer. The guy next door who was simply invisible. Sanchez shares a characteristic of many serial sexual murderers. These offenders are in a class of their own in as much as those who are, see them in their environment, they don't see somebody who's mentally ill, who's psychotic, yet they all have a dark side and they're extremely dangerous and extremely violent, although the average person doesn't see it. 